Nadja, welcome. Thank you. She's wearing, Thank you. she's wearing her, her crystals. Now, I would like to know, first of all, this is a very basic question, and you probably, many of you probably know this, but what is the difference between a diamond and a crystal? Well, they, they both are incredibly brilliant, but uh, in terms of a chemical point of view, there is a difference in hardness. So crystal has the hardness from the scale of one to 10 of 8.3, and the diamond is a 10. Okay. So that chemical ingredient is certainly a difference, but um, you know, the price point and is tremendously different. And, and you can be so much more creative with a crystal because the loss factor is less, you know, and that's the really- The loss factor is yes, less, Yes, so you, you play around with the design. The design might not be good. Well, at the end of the day, it might be a handful of crystal. And you cannot run that risk working with diamonds. So, so but crystals are manufactured mm -hmm. and diamonds are found in the earth. Correct. Correct. So Correct. that is another difference. Absolutely. And I have to say from my point of view, when I first started in this, in my career, uh, working in the family business, which I never wanted to do initially, um, I always had this confrontation about truly the diamond versus the crystal. And uh, the way I found myself really promoting crystal is to try to explain to people how hard it is to make a crystal. You know, there's so many different chemicals that are involved in um, making a crystal. They're melted, uh, they come out like honey from this big melting pot, then they um, drip into molds. You have to let the, the hot glass, so to speak, cool off, then it has to be cut, then we have a very strict quality control. Not one crystal leaves the factory with a scratch on it or a bubble in it. So, you know, I grew up seeing this incredibly labor-intensive process, and I was always a little bit disappointed um, to see people dismiss the crystal compared to a diamond. Hmm. So it was really the engineering and the technical element that I always had to go back to and embrace. Were you a girl who just like wanted diamonds? No, I was a girl that wanted crystals. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> now, can you tell the difference between a diamond and a crystal? So I have to say, I did study gemology. I can tell the difference. Uh, the brilliance of the diamond is incredible. Um, the refractive index is higher than that of crystal. But then again, you know, the thing about crystal, you can use it on so many different surfaces. Again, back to that creative element. And often you don't see the crystal, you see the impact the crystal has. You see the hue, you see the refraction, you sense the energy on a gown or a jewelry piece. Right. So this is really where we have almost used crystal as fairy dust mm -hmm. on the various different um, objects, whether it's jewelry, interior, lighting, decor and so on. I, I was just telling Nadja backstage, this friend of mine from the Most Powerful Women community, her husband built a house for her in Florida and he decorated the whole house and she went down and she saw it for the first time and he said, these curtains are Swarovski crystals. <laughs> and then he told her the price and she's like, what? <laughs> but anyway, oh. what? What is the most sort of um, out there uh, application of Swar Swarovski crystals? Well, I have to say we've seen many fascinating applications and sometimes we cannot control how our customers use the product. Sometimes it's totally shocking and sometimes it's absolutely inspirational. Um, I don't know if you that live here in London have seen the little Mercedes driving around covered in Swarovski crystal. That's a customer of ours. That's nothing that we would have done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but because sometimes it can slightly go off, um, it's really important for us to demonstrate really beautiful examples of how crystal can be used and hopefully therefore inspire the industry of how to do that. So for example, we've worked with Academy for uh, the last 12 years to decorate the stage at the Oscars. Um, we recently had the honor to work with the architect Daniel Liebeskind to create the star at Rockefeller Center, which is always such a wonderful sensation at Christmas time in New York City. So, so this is fascinating, and Nadja just mentioned this to me backstage. This is a, this is a deal that you you had the idea to do this, and just explain that. The, the Swarovski crystal star for the first time last Christmas on the top of the Rockefeller Center tree, um, explain how that came about. Well, you know, first of all, our philosophy is always, and actually our purpose is to spark 
delight. You know, we are truly there to enhance the world and, and really bring joy to people's lives. So Daniel Liebeskind and I collaborated on a project where we created a chess set for him and each little... The architect, Daniel Liebeskind. Exactly. Yes. He created the Freedom Tower to replace the Twin Towers, but um, each chess set was one of his buildings. And I just thought, this man is so kind, he's so wonderful, and I am looking for a new architect to create the star of the Christmas tree. But I realized, you know, Daniel was Jewish, and I asked him, would he be interested to do that? And he's like, of course, you know? And it, this star is about hope, it's about faith, um, and we concluded, you know, nowadays it is so much about hope and faith. It's not necessarily about religion. Religion is being used too many times as an excuse. So we just felt this is a wonderful moment to really take an object and adorn the environment and truly bring joy to people. And it's wonderful. Will you be doing that again absolutely. this year with him? Yes, we will. What's the what? What is the one sort of dream you've had about using your crystals for some cultural or big event where you haven't been able to do it? My gosh, okay, that's a really long list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I have to say we've been so lucky to really, I think because we've chosen the architects and the designers that we work with so carefully, we therefore have been able to get into beautiful locations. So for example, you we- You can't name one that yes. you're hoping for? No, absolutely, let me, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which one, but I just wanted to give an example of where we are now. We are, we've created the first permanent contemporary installation in Versailles. And this is really because we worked with these young French designers called the Bourlic Brothers, and actually Versailles wanted a permanent installation, and it was a big competition. The Bourlic Brothers won, and they really wanted to create a chandelier. And as an Austrian company, we're so honored to have been chosen for this installation in this the French huh. historic monument versus other French uh, crystal manufacturers. Uh -huh. And it's a chandelier that basically lights up as it gets dark and it dims down as it gets, um, sorry, it, yeah, it dims down as it get, gets light outside. And um, the modernity of that piece is such a beautiful juxtaposition to the very, very classical and traditional environment. Um, so we're very proud about that. We also, with the same architects, created these fountains at the Champs-Élysées uh, just a few months ago, and it was absolutely extraordinary because, as you know, and we talked about it yesterday, the yellow vests were destroying so much in Paris, including the Swarovski store, actually. But these fountains that are made of crystal are untouched, you know, right there on the Champs-Élysées. So, I can't help but think that the product truly, or the emotion the designer invests in creating something permeates out to the end consumer. And in that case, there's so much kindness and sincerity involved in the creation. How many of you have seen the movie Rocket Man? Not it came many, out last it just week. opened. <laughs> I think a lot time. of us are dying to see it. But um, one million Swarovski crystals mm -hmm. are, I, I haven't seen it yet, so. They adorn Elton like one million at Absolutely. one time? Yes. Hmm. And Is that true to life? Did he really no, wear Swarovski? Not at all. So that was a time period when he actually, when sequins was very popular. Sequins. And this was actually really before we have reintroduced ourselves to the film industry, to the fashion industry. Um, but I have to say it was wonderful to work with Julian Day, the costume designer, and uh -huh. it was really the Dodgers outfit that Elton John wore, oh, which yeah. was fully covered in crystal. Wow. And again, we see that over and over, you know, we really started from the very beginning of the silver screen to adorn the actors and actresses, you know, all the jewelry and breakfast at Tiffany's, including Audrey Hepburn's tiara. That's all Swarovski crystal. Uh, <laughs> and you mentioned but, to me backstage who your first customer was. Yes, and that was Queen Victoria. And we are so proud to see that peaceful cohabitation of diamonds and crystals. Well, Queen Victoria is wearing her diamond jewelry, her gowns are adorned with crystals, huh. and that was via the British couturier Worth, who was based in Paris. And we're so excited to still today um, are able to dress her granddaughter, yes. the Queen. And I'm so honored to also mention that we've just received the royal warrant for the supply to her household of Swarovski crystal. And we've worked with her costume, our dress designer, Angela Kelly, on her costumes. And again, you don't necessarily see the crystal, 
you sense it. Subconsciously, you sense that there is just this hue. So you mentioned that I was going to ask you, and I'll ask you right now, choice or destiny working for the family business. You actually mentioned that you didn't mm -hmm. really want to go into the family mm -hmm. business. So why are you here? That's <laughs> 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 so basically, I just, um, you know, I grew up in this, in this business. I grew up in the factory, basically. My father and my grandfather, they were the engineers, of course. Every weekend, we had to go look at all the machines. And I thought, gosh, <laughs> can't we do something else? And it wasn't <laughs> until eventually, you know, I studied art history, my father kept on calling, asking me how my engineering study was coming along. And I would blow into the phone, saying, Dad, I can't hear you. Hello, bad connection. <laughs> Off to art history class. In any case, I felt very um, strongly about finding my own passion and my own identity. And I definitely did not believe in nepotism. And then eventually, I found myself working at Gagosian Gallery in Sotheby's in New York City, and then eventually in the fashion industry working for European fashion brands, uh -huh. family businesses like um, the Missoni family, Trussardi, Valentino, and then I thought, well, wait a minute, actually, I also do have a family business that has its roots in fashion. Uh -huh. It's based in Europe. And that was really my aha moment, because at that time, Swarovski was really known for its crystal animals. Mm -hmm. And I was just remembering all these stories that my grandfather used to tell me about working with Coco Chanel and Christian Dior. And my question was, well, where are all the designers? Where are they? No, but there are no designers. Swarovski's not working with the designers. So that was my aha moment to come back to the business, copy what my grandfather did, and I was in search for my Christian Dior, and that ended up being Alexander McQueen. So what year did you enter the business? So that was in 1995, mm -hmm. and I instantly actually worked in Hong Kong for two years, mm -hmm. and it was a really great bird's eye point of view, far, far away from headquarters. And um, I would run into these designers, and then I would say to them, yeah, let me, let me send our salespeople to show you the crystal. And then I'd run into the salespeople on the way to the designer, wearing their gray suits, the little suitcase. They have done zero research about the designer, and I thought, well, it's not going to happen. So I thought, that's it. I have my idea. I'm going back to New York City. I'm creating a showroom. And I developed this apothecary concept of the crystals, really showing the 350,000 different variations of crystals. And I just thought, you know, just alone the psychology of being able to invite somebody to your space and then pointing everything out and then showing what has happened in the past. You know, all these things like Dorothy's slippers covered in Swarovski crystals. Nobody knew it, but everyone has seen it. You know, it was just really a matter of getting back to our history and um, showing the current design community what has been done and what yet can be done in the future. So connecting the brand to sort of the culture, the, the, the global culture and the sort of cultural zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that, so Nadja also six years ago uh, set up a foundation, mm -hmm. which Swarovski never had. Uh, set up a sustainability department, which mm -hmm. Swarovski never had, and you've made great strides in that area. I do, I, I feel free to address that, but I do want to open it up to you. Who has questions? <laughs> yes, right here. Hi, thank you very much. Hannah Milano, professor of entrepreneurship at a technical university. So. Um, you mentioned wonderful things in reconnecting the brand back to the designing and arts and architecture, mm -hmm. etc. community. I just wondered, do you ever work back with technical universities in terms of connecting the technology Absolutely. back to all of this? And if we can support you, I'm more than happy yes, to Yes, I'd love that. to talk to you. <laughs> and we do, absolutely. We work with Cambridge University, MIT, um, the Fraunhofer Institute, but and that's absolutely important. And I have to say, my great-great-grandfather was such an inventor. Uh, innovation was so important to us, and it's re we really believe that innovation will be what will take us into the future. So, absolutely. Anyone else? Um, mm. To the point of innovation, um, so you're actually manufacturing mm -hmm. Diamonds That's right. now. Yes. Explain that. Okay, so the next innovation, uh, the next disruptor to the industry is lab grown diamonds. And um, Swarovski has started to cut gemstones in the 60s, and we cut them in the same or similar technology as we cut the crystal. We are master cutters. Um, we did try to start uh, cutting diamonds in the 60s, and my father and grandfather received death threats. So we stopped the diamonds. 
uh, we continued with gemstones and you know yes as you mentioned I started the sustainability department and I thought so truly uh, let me uh, let me just address this so I mean you know so they're making diamonds and I, I I'm like but diamonds come from the earth and Nadja says, no, these are real diamonds mm -hmm. that we are making in a lab because they have all the components, the chemical exactly. components of yeah. diamonds. They're bioidentical and um, they are incredibly sustainable because they use very little um, energy to produce and they certainly don't affect people or planet. Uh -huh. And um, we just felt it is our answer to our sustainability initiative um, again, yes, we have been talking to diamond people and I can only say or that my answer to them was, you know, we are totally for everything that sparkles. Um, and the <laughs> minute you um, are able to mine the diamond sustainably, we will be your customer. You know, if Swarovski can have a positive impact by using, using created diamonds in order to make the other miners more sustainable, that is a positive impact on the world, you know? And I truly believe there are enough customers, you know, I, I really believe in the um, era of collaboration versus competition. But how is the diamond industry responding to this so They far? are very worried. They're yeah. very worried. I mean, we see what De Beers has um, done. They're now starting their own created diamonds, um, which is wonderful. Again, they, are, they do amazing colored diamonds, so I've already, expressed my interest in colored diamonds. <laughs> if they ever start um, uh, delivering to external people, I think at this point they just want to keep the colored diamonds to themselves. But no, the industry is reacting. The entire world is reacting. And again, it's the world of transparency. It, I mean, we have so many organizations, you know, from the UN to GIA, the Gemological Institute. It is truly about um, better ways. And the reason why we're not there yet is because companies did not want to invest the money or the time to, to come up with better ways of, of um, extracting materials from the earth. Mm -hmm. But it's totally doable. And what is the price point of these manufactured so diamonds versus real diamonds? Initially, the uh, lab-grown diamonds were 50% less than the real diamonds, but now that De Beers is really creating such a huge supply, the price will go down. Mm -hmm. But I find that's okay. Um, so we've just launched a collection of created diamonds designed by Penelope Cruz, who has expressed that she would like to work with us because she shares our values of sustainability. Of course, we were so honored by her proposal, so she's created a collection of red carpet jewelry for herself. Um, we've worked with Stephen Webster, the British uh, jewelry designer, and just now we launched a collection by Prince Dimitri of Yugoslavia in Las Vegas last week at the jewelry fair, and uh, Dimitri is a graduate gemologist. He was head of um, jewelry at Sotheby's, so he really comes from a very strong, uh, fine jewelry background, and it's such an honor for us that he is embracing the created diamonds. So the point is, it's a matter of the design and the storytelling, kind of like Coco Chanel. When she started to design, she really mixed um, crystals and glass and diamonds. She wanted to keep people guessing what the ingredients are, but the, the most important element was that it was beautiful design. And can you tell the difference between a natural diamond and a manufactured diamond? So it's so hard because clearly the, I mean, the man-made diamonds do have flaws and inclusions, but it's mainly really the, the flawless ones that are being cut. So it's hard to tell, but in our case, anything that's above 0.5 carats, we laser engrave. We make sure that the, our logo's in there. You know, this is not about counterfeiting. Um, this is really about showing a product that is sustainable. Hmm. Well, I certainly learned a lot, Nadja, and I think the group here, the most powerful women did. So thank you very much. We'd love to have you thank back. You. Don't let this be your last yes, time. Yes, it was such an honor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.